Okay, then we would move on to our next presenter, and um, I have the pleasure to briefly introduce Jonathan Kimmelman, a professor at McGill University, and by the way, also the chair and co-chair of the Ethical Committee of ISSCR and also an expert in gene therapy. We thought and it might be quite valuable in addition to the, the, the clinical insights um, and scientific insights that we had also to bring in a little bit of an ethical flavor and I think you are the best person to introduce us into that world as well. I'm looking forward to your presentation. Thanks so much, Axel. Um, so it's really a, a thrill to be here. I um, used to make a habit of attending ASGCT in the uh, first few years of my uh, assistant professorship, and I haven't been here for many years, and so uh, it's great to be back here and to see all the familiar faces. And of course, it's uh, very, very humbling to uh, be speaking after Alessandro's uh, uh, amazing presentation and amazing work. I, I, I really don't belong here. Anyway, okay, let's get started. So um, what I want to do in this talk is go through some of the ethical challenges that the field of gene transfer has encountered in the past that the field is encountering in the present and that I see as emerging over the next uh, five to ten years uh, that, uh, as we move forward. I also want to start with a uh, conflict of interest disclosure slide. I sit on a data safety monitoring board of what used to be uh, Dimension Therapeutics and that's uh, in a remunerative capacity. Okay, so let's start with the bad old days of gene transfer. So as everyone here probably knows, the very first gene transfer study, somewhere around 1990 or so, gene transfer got off to a rocky start. By the mid-1990s, the field was starting to get some criticism. There was a famous report, Workin and Moltowski report, that uh, criticized the field for having rushed some products into clinical trials, for having uh, cultivated uh, overly optimistic expectations uh, among uh, other scientists as well as uh, within the public and for having not always designed early phase trials in a way that would really advance the science, that would really be informative. And of course, that unfavorable report was sort of amplified by the debacle that we all know about of the death of Jesse Gelsinger, a relatively healthy volunteer who participated in an adenoviral adenoviral vector gene transfer study in 1999. A couple of years after that, some really encouraging findings emerging from France about the use of uh, gamma retroviruses to treat X1 skid. Unfortunately, uh, it emerged that some of the patients developed, as we all know, in social mutagenesis uh, events that led to leukemias, a series of deaths uh, here as well as in a few other studies as a result of that. Uh, so really a kind of a, a series of really, really challenge, big, big challenges for gene transfer in the early field. Now, this is another event that happened. People don't usually link this to gene transfer. For some reason, I, I'm always sort of puzzled what gets counted as gene transfer and what's not. Uh, but this was also, to me, sort of a, a really kind of inauspicious event when the STEP trial that was testing a genetically modified adenovirus as a vaccine uh, for HIV when it turned out that seroconversion rates were actually higher in the adenoviral group than in the placebo group. A big setback uh, in terms of vaccine development, not perceived as a setback for gene transfer, but to me sort of bundled together with the tremendous challenges that the field uh, encountered. So for a while, it really seemed that gene transfer just simply couldn't get a break. There were, at the time, sort of three, I think, there were a number of major ethical challenges uh, that the field encountered that were sort of debated uh, in the literature and at scientific conferences, but there were three in particular that I think had the most amount of prominence. The first was the issue about unrealistic expectations. I mentioned already the uh, moltowski orkin report that criticized some scientists, at least, for having, a, uh, as I said, fostered unrealistic expectations. Uh, and that's, of course, uh, manifest by some of the kinds of headlines that we saw through the late 1990s, like this one in the New York Times that proclaimed in 1994 an expectation that we would have a cure for hemophilia by uh, the year 2000. Uh, it's now 2018. We have some really encouraging findings from hemophilia studies, but not exactly a cure uh, quite yet. And so um, really good evidence here that there was a mismatch between what was scientifically realistic um, and, what, and, uh, and what was actually presented uh, in public settings. Uh, 
The second really recurrent ethical issue, hotly debated, particularly in the recombinant DNA advisory community, was the question of when to initiate early phase clinical trials. When do we go from animal studies into patients? Um, and uh, I'm going to come back to that debate uh, uh, a little bit, but, um, but this was always sort of a, bi a, a big challenge. If you go through rack minutes, you always see that this is sort of a struggle to kind of decide whether the evidence is compelling enough that an early phase study has a prospect of leading to a result that's going to be scientifically informative and perhaps even uh, benefit patients who enroll. The third issue that was also hotly debated and extensively discussed in the early phase of gene transfers history was the issue about informed consent. Most patients who enroll in uh, gene transfer clinical studies, uh, typically early phase studies, are patients with advanced disease, incurable diseases. These are patients who often have uh, 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 very high, or who are bringing very high expectations to uh, enrollment uh, in clinical trials. And so there was a lot of debate and discussion about how consent documents, uh, how consent conversations ought to proceed in order to make sure patients' expectations were adequately and realistically calibrated uh, to the nature of the science. Great, so that's the, early, the overview of the early ethical issues that the field encountered. Let's move on to the present uh, so-called second act of gene transfer. And now, in reverse to what happened in the early days when it seemed like the field of gene therapy just simply couldn't catch a break, Today, it's the exact reverse. Gene therapy seems like it can almost do no wrong. Um, I sometimes think that the New England Journal of Medicine ought to be renamed the New England Journal of Gene Therapy because uh, you virtually can't pick up uh, an issue of New England uh, without seeing some kind of major, major advance. I'll just go through a bunch of these uh, really quickly. We've seen this, with, and we've heard about this already here today, with Scott Aldrich. Uh, of course, uh, congenital, uh, uh, Lieber's congenital amaurosis uh, studies uh, in the early uh, aughts. Um, cerebral adrenal leukodystrophy, uh, spinal muscular atrophy. Uh, of course, we have the CAR T cell uh, studies as well. Uh, sickle cell, we heard about that briefly here as well, beta thalassemia. Um, and now, of course, we actually have products that are licensed. We heard about licensure in EMA as well in the FDA 2017, the very first licensure of a gene transfer product, in this case for leukemia and uh, uh, within the same year, the first licensure of a product for treating congenital, uh, uh, Lieber's congenital amaurosis. Okay, great. So where are we with yesterday's ethical issues? Are the ethical issues that we were encountering in the late 90s and the early aughts fully resolved now that gene transfer has reached this period of, uh, of, of, of incredible productivity in terms of patient welfare? Well, let's go back and look at the three issues that I highlighted. First, the issue about unrealistic expectations. I mean, there's probably been some improvement in this in some respects, and I don't want to hold, say, gene transfer is unique. This is a challenge in many other aspects of therapeutic development, but I think there continue to be major challenges with ensuring that uh, the public has well-calibrated expectations uh, around uh, the science. Uh, for one, I think it's important to remember that, of course, uh, we have some tremendous advances in gene transfer right now. Uh, to date, at least, none of the approaches uh, are uh, treating diseases that are highly prevalent diseases, uh, the, the diseases that really are the ones that are driving mortality in society. So we still have a lot of progress to go in gene transfer in terms of having a major public health impact, although to be sure, we've made a lot of progress already. But I think more importantly, it's still not that uncommon to read press releases, uh, statements, uh, uh, summaries in areas that are at least allied with gene transfer that I think cultivate or foster the same kinds of unrealistic ex expectations uh, that were criticized early in the 1990s and uh, in the aughts. Uh, this is just an example of a study, uh, an abstract that was published on uh, the use of uh, antisense oligonucleotides to treat Huntington's disease. This was a study in patients that was using surrogate endpoints. And if you, this was actually just this year, April 25th, 2018, if you actually look at the, uh, at the press coverage of this, uh, you find very little qualification of how challenging it may be to go from these early encouraging findings through to actual successful clinical translation for a disease like Huntington's disease. And instead, you find quotes in this uh, abstract that I think I, I find a, a bit effusive, and um, I worry in terms of the expectations they may create among patients. So for example, you have statements saying that these findings are tremendously exciting, and it, the kicker is uh, one uh, quote there that says, seriously, this is shockingly exciting. <laughs> 
Okay, so I think we can do a little bit better. Um, there actually is, I think, since the early aughts, there's been a growing literature in ethics about how we can communicate better with patients about uh, emergent science and about the potential impact uh, of uh, poor communications with various publics. This is just a study that was published in BMJ 2014. And what they did is they looked at the relationship between effusive language in press releases and effusive languages language in the actual press reports, in the, in the news reports. And what they found was that when universities released press releases that were measured or balanced, that generally speaking, the press reports were much more measured and balanced. In contrast, when universities released press releases of uh, emergent findings uh, that, were, that didn't have balance, that seemed to foster unrealistic ex expectations, not surprisingly, the press reports, the press coverage, also tended to have uh, less balance. So progress to be made there as well. What about the issue of when to initiate early phase studies? Well, I think here too there's been a lot of progress over the last 10 or 15 years in trying to think this issue through, but I'm not sure I can say there's been a huge amount of progress in terms of systematizing and improving the decision making about initiation of early phase studies. In fact, over the last 10 years or so, there's been uh, uh, an emergent literature about some of the challenges in reproducibility and reporting uh, that we see recurrently in preclinical research. This was uh, a study that looked at uh, actually uh, how reproducible high impact findings uh, were within the in-house laboratories at Amgen. In this particular study, only 11% of findings were actually re uh, reproducible, at least in Amgen's in-house uh, laboratories. So this raises questions about the quality of evidence we're uh, sometimes, not always, but sometimes using as a basis for launching uh, clinical trials. Now this continues to surprise me. Uh, I, for, I think I spent the first five years of my life, of my career rather, uh, doubting that this was true, but it really, really is true. FDA and other regulators don't really scrutinize carefully the preclinical evidence of efficacy before interventions are launched into phase one studies. FDA and other regulators are primarily concerned with safety. That they look at very carefully, but when it comes to uh, evidence of efficacy, uh, it's the uh, review is much less stringent. Now there's a footnote to that. With cell and gene therapy, it's more stringent than it is with small molecules. So there is some vetting, but it's far from perfect. And that's illustrated by this particular episode here. This is a cell therapy, not a gene uh, therap therapeutic approach, where uh, a, a biotech company put into phase one clinical testing a cell therapy product that, in fact, there was preclinical evidence showing uh, actually from the, the group that actually developed the product, preclinical evidence showing that the particular cell preparation actually didn't remit uh, spinal cord injury in preclinical animal models. Nevertheless, the company went forward into clinical trials and the uh, editorialists when this was reported in uh, stem cell reports uh, were quoted as saying uh, these data raise questions about the lack of FDA requirements for in vivo testing of intended cell lines. So I think we have a lot of progress to make in terms of the ways that we rationalize and justify uh, early phase studies. Not always, but sometimes. The third issue is about informed consent. Um, there was a huge amount of progress, I think, in the aughts about trying to improve the language that we use when we conduct informed consent. There was an amazing guidance that was produced for the NIH at the OBA uh, for uh, uh, communication about uh, risk benefit. Uh, in early phase and later phase gene transfer clinical trials. In preparation for this talk, I actually couldn't find this on the OBA website. Maybe it's there and I missed it, but it was really, really difficult to find. I ultimately found this actually through a Georgetown archive, which is really, really sad because it was an excellent document. But here too, I, don't, I think we may have won the battles, but not necessarily won the war. Um, this is some of the language that that uh, report recommended for phase one studies, that, that when you're talking about benefits, for example, you should say something like, it's very unlikely that the, uh, getting the gene transfer will improve your health. Important footnote, that's not always true. There may be, very well be some early phase gene transfer studies where there is more of an expectation of benefit. But generically, if you're testing a, a fairly novel intervention, then expectations of benefit ought to be relatively low. There's good evidentiary reasons to support that claim. But instead, what you often see, not always, but often see in informed consent documents is a statement like this, the treatment may or may not benefit you. Now, if any of you have ever taken a course in statistics, we can convert that into ma mathematical formalism, and it would look like this. Your probability of benefit is somewhere between zero and one. 
This has almost no information in it at all. And I think we can do better in terms of conveying to patients uh, a realistic assessment of uh, how likely they are to benefit when they enter into phase one studies. Uh, and as I said, generally speaking, with exceptions, uh, these uh, pro prospect of major clinical benefit is going to be low in early phase studies. Let's pivot to talking about what I think are some of the important emerging ethical issues in gene transfer that we're going to be confronting as gene transfer approaches uh, move into late phase studies and move into commercialization. And I think there are six in particular that I think are important to consider. The first is the issue about choice of comparators. The gene transfer products that have been licensed, to my knowledge, have been uh, licensed on the basis of open label studies, I think. But uh, choice of comparators is always a very contentious topic. Do we use open label studies? Do we, we of course, we always worry when, with open label studies about the use of historical controls. Uh, alternatively, in gene transfer approaches that involve some kind of surgical delivery, the rational and most fastidious kind of uh, com comparator is going to be sham comparators. And we see this in many areas, for example, uh, cardiology, uh, uh, gene and cell therapy, many of those studies are using uh, sham comparators. There was a flurry of scholarship and literature about the ethics of sham comparator clinical trials in the late 1990s and early aughts. And I've reviewed this literature fairly recently, and I can say that that literature does not really adequately resolve the issues about when it's appropriate to use a sham comparator and what types of sham comparators ought to be used in clinical trials. And it's not hard to go to the literature and to find examples of cell therapy studies, maybe not gene therapy, I don't know, but cell therapy studies for sure, where this kind of a dubious rationale or justification for using the particular kinds of sham comparators that they use. So I think there's going to be a lot of challenges with trying to uh, get right the issue about what comparators to use, particularly when we're talking about surgical delivery. Okay. The second issue I want to highlight is it's tempting to think that now that the bad old days of gene therapy are over and we're in this sort of, you know, golden age, um, that risks are, you know, risks are somehow sort of tamped down and controlled. But what I want to suggest is that probably, like, you know, I can't say for sure, I've got no crystal ball, but probably risk benefit is probably going to be not that much different. We may have a little bit less uncertainty, to be sure, but in terms of overall aggregate level of risk and benefit, what we've gained in terms of reducing uh, uncertainty, what we've gained in terms of refining technologies, is likely to be offset by all sorts of other kinds of changes that you typically see as interventions mature. So for example, you'll see uh, eligibility of patients are relaxed. So Alessandro was talking briefly about uh, enrollment of a patient with hepatitis C. This is an example where you're, you know, taking a little bit more risk in some ways because you've controlled other risks, but the overall risk benefit balance is staying uh, fairly the same. Application of technique, uh, oftentimes maybe less fastidious. Oversight maybe a little bit less, uh, less uh, fastidious as well uh, as products, uh, as we develop more familiarity uh, with products. And barriers to putting interventions into trials uh, become potentially lower. This is a study that I did looking not at gene therapy product, but looking at a small molecule. It's a drug called serafinib. It's used to treat cancer. And in the horizontal axis is years, and in the vertical axis, all the indications that were tested in serafinib, all the different kinds of malignancies. And all you need to know from this is that the first few indications that were tested are the ones that led to an FDA license and that actually had a major impact on cancer. And all the other indications that were tested as you go down were mostly negative clinical trials as indicated by those red nodes uh, on that graph, uh, indicating here that a lot of the value, the greatest clinical impact was actually obtained early on in development and that later on there's actually an accumulation of a lot of burden with relatively little clinical gain. So if gene transfer follows the same path that a lot of small molecules uh, have followed, um, we can expect that risk benefit might not change all that much as products mature. In fact, in some ways it could get worse as people are more permissive about the kinds of indications that they're testing them in. I also just want to emphasize that although gene therapy hasn't encountered this to nearly the same degree as cell therapy, there are examples of overseas clinics that are offering uh, gene therapy, uh, unproven gene therapeutic approaches with all sorts of nifty uh, patient testimonials to, uh, to attract patients. And this is another example of the way that risk can expand as a product moves, in, moves away from very controlled settings into less controlled settings.
The third major challenge are altering regulatory standards, particularly in the United States. I think there are three different changes in the regulatory landscape that I think we're all struggling with. The first is the so-called right to try movement, a, a movement that's really supported primarily by uh, uh, libertarian uh, think tanks that's aimed at trying to uh, uh, authorize regulatory approval of drugs after completion of phase one clinical testing rather than completion of efficacy testing in phase two and phase three. There also are a number of different legislative initiatives, particularly around cell therapies, maybe to some extent around gene therapies, that are aimed at trying to grant earlier licensure of uh, these products. For example, in Japan, uh, there is a policy now that grants licensure of cell therapeutic products after phase one testing, but before demonstration of efficacy. And a third is the emerging uh, the series of court decisions that are granting, that are treating uh, marketing of products off-label as a form of free speech, which makes it very, very difficult for regulators to demand efficacy evidence uh, before uh, approval of, of products. And so this may very well alter the landscape of the evidence that's demanded for areas like gene therapy uh, before they actually make it out there into the market. And I think it's important to address these critiques of regulation by emphasizing just how important stringent oversight is for innovation. Uh, there are a lot of different reasons why that's the case, but one of the reasons why that's the case is because when you prevent a company from marketing a product until they've demonstrated efficacy and safety rigorously, you create incredibly powerful incentives for companies to develop highly uh, 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 rigorous and um, uh, uh, high-level, high uh, high-quality uh, clinical evidence around the efficacy and safety of their products. And so in that way, innovation is actually supported, not necessarily impeded, by smart regulations. The fourth issue is the issue of pharmacovigilance. I was really interested in Alessandra's talk about, uh, about the long-term follow-up of patients. I think this is going to be a major challenge for areas like gene transfer, particularly where we're dealing with products that are treating very niche uh, patient populations. This, to me, is a really sobering slide that was a, from a paper that was published by someone at the EMA and what it speaks to is the number of patients you need in order to detect safety signal. So generally speaking, when products are licensed, um, we actually have very, very limited statistical power to detect safety uh, signals. In this particular slide, what, what you see is um, if you have a background incidence of a condition, let's say cardiac events of 6 in 1,000, and your product causes an increase of 1 in 1,000 more than that, you need a population of about 160,000 people to observe in order to have 80% power to detect that extra one in a thousand adverse events. And so the bottom line is for all but the most obvious adverse events, the ones that clobber you over the head and that hit you immediately or that have particular signatures that allow you to attribute causality, you need lots of patient exposure over many years to begin to ha have confidence about the safety, the, the long-term safety of interventions. And it's going to be a really big challenge, I think, in gene transfer to develop systems that have the long-term follow-up in place uh, that, uh, that also allow us to have those populations. Okay, uh, I'm going to be running out of time, so I'm going to try to move really quickly. Uh, the fifth big issue is the issue about new applications. Uh, and um, here the issue is uh, increasing use of gene transfer in reproductive contexts. We've heard about the birth, for example, of children using mitochondrial replacement techniques. Also, there were uh, discussions in the early 90s about the use of uh, gene transfer in utero. To my knowledge, this has not yet been put into clinical testing, but there have been reports recently of in utero uh, uh, small molecules uh, or, um, or, or large molecules being used to treat uh, conditions. And I expect that this is an issue that's likely to uh, re-emerge uh, in, the, in the coming years. And let me last speak to the elephant in the room and probably the most important and impactful issue, and that's the issue of access. So, so far, most of the conditions that we've treated, uh, that we've been successful treating, are small kind of orphan disorders, and that's great. So far, not so many big successes in terms of more prevalent diseases and diseases that affect populations that have the greatest deprivations. There have been some encouraging data out there that are mostly using surrogate endpoints. For example, we have this encouraging uh, Ebola vaccine, a clinical trial that was published in Lancet a few years back. But for the most part, I think the big challenge is going to be trying to transform gene transfer uh, 
from an area that has niche applications to an area that potentially has important public health applications. And one of the big challenges that the field is likely to encounter, I think is already encountering, is the issue of cost. This is a wonderful slide, a wonderful figure from an MIT uh, uh, technology review that looked at the relationship between the incidence of disease and the actual cost of the various products that are now uh, beginning to be marketed. But uh, essentially all you need to see is that these products so far that are marketed are enormously expensive. And so the question is, what's the game plan for the field of gene transfer for making sure that gene transfer doesn't simply recapitulate the unconscionable kinds of health inequalities that we deal with in practically every other therapeutic uh, regime? It's tempting to say, well, this is not our problem so much uh, in gene transfer. Uh, this is for other people to solve. But I think that um, it is something that the field of gene transfer really, really needs to think carefully about and confront. What is the plan for making sure that these, uh, you know, uh, really important approaches uh, uh, reach uh, not just the most privileged populations, but the populations uh, that probably need these approaches the most? And I'll stop there. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Jonathan, for a really thought-provoking talk, um, which is now open for discussion. Well, I would have a more general question. I mean, you mentioned certainly patient-informed consent. I mean, that's certainly also a, a kind of delivery of information to the patients to be educated about the treatment form. I mean, how, how about broader dissemination into society? I mean, where could we do better in terms of transferring novel innovations, treatment opportunities, and also realistic results, you know, in terms of transferring the knowledge into society so that it, uh, that this is, you know, equally well um, dealt with. Because sometimes I feel that, especially if we are in, in fast-moving fields, you know, with a lot of innovative pace, that we keep, uh, that we lose a little bit track of this, um, to, to do this in a, in a straightforward and um, realistic and well-balanced manner. Yeah, so it's a, it's a great, great question, and um, I have a couple different thoughts. So first of all, um, I do think it's really important for professional societies uh, and for scientists to find ways to engage publics other than just merely in the clinical setting where you're recruiting patients. And um, there have been, I mean, ISSCR, I've been involved in ISSCR. There is sort of a patient, uh, you know, and public sort of outreach uh, materials there that help to try to convey to patients uh, a picture about what the state of the art science is, how far we are from important clinical applications and whatnot. And one of the reasons why that is so important, among the many different reasons, is because at least in the area of cell therapy, there are a lot of different clinics that are proliferating that are offering unproven uh, cell-based intervention for a fee to patients outside of clinical trials. So it's really important that professional societies uh, that are working in these areas are developing informational materials to make sure that patients really have uh, sort of a sense of what questions to ask when they go to these clinics and what kinds of, uh, what kinds of developments to, uh, to expect. So, uh, I mean, I can say more, but, th but that's, you know, that, uh, you know, I, I think it is, I just would reinforce the point that um, communications is not merely a point about informed consent, it's also about the way that we issue press releases and the way that we make uh, information materials available for patients and their family members, even outside of the uh, even outside of the uh, clinical trial setting. And then, I mean, you also made a brief comment, you know, on, you know, sort of um, the trajectory of risk and risk behavior. I mean, certainly, you know, I mean, it's, it's great to see that we have these highly su successful clinical trials these days. Um, but, I mean, as you mentioned, what would be your trajectory and, and take on that? I mean, do you think... Um, we should be more risk-taking or that should be equally well balanced according to the standards that we have. Um, 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 certainly it has been successful, but is that also um, risky in a way? So, Right. Well, just let me just, one really quick thing, I want to correct the language. So a, tr a trial is successful if it answers a scientific question, not if it's positive. So I just want to make sure to, to get the language right here. So we've, gene therapy has always had a lot of successful trials because they've answered questions even if they haven't always been po positive studies. Um, just coming back to the issue, so I, I worry a bit uh, that as you get a product that shows efficacy in a single indication, that it's tempting to try to extend that product to other applications and that our standards of evidence begin to sort of lower more rapidly than they should as we try to extend those applications. 
And so I think it's important that we not relax the demand for good preclinical and prior clinical evidence as we try to take validated interventions and extend them to other applications or extend them to combinations with other therapeutics, et cetera. Because at least when I look at what happens in cancer for small molecules, what you see, I think, I think is that the evidentiary standards for launching trials that are aimed at extending small molecules to malignancies other than the ones that got FDA approval seem to sort of diminish. And, and so, you know, again, what you have is this kind of uh, treadmill of, of risk and benefit. You know, on the one hand, you know, maybe risk is a little bit less because we know something about what kinds of patients to exclude in the studies, and yet there, that benefit in terms of reducing risk is offset by a little bit more permissiveness about the circumstances under which you test the product. That's a question. Elise Legec de Lansalut from Gyroscope Therapeutics in London. Thank you for your really interesting talk. Uh, I have a comment which would be followed by a question. Um, I think for the communication actually of the gene and cell therapy as companies or even as academical researchers, there is also a conflict of interest where we need to attract the fundings. So we need to show our best results, obviously. So, my, so this is my comment. And then the question would be, who do you think should uh, educate the general population about gene and cell therapy? Because I think I work in a company and I want this to go to the patients. But on the other side, I think that maybe someone else should do the education work and not the companies because we want the fundings, of course. Yeah, no, so, I, so I, I, um, I, 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 re I realized there was one other point I wanted to make, but so I, I agree with you that there is often a conflict of interest when scientists and when, or when companies communicate with the public about their findings. And that's why I think it's really important for responsible institutions, particularly uh, academic institutions that have baked into them a goal of serving the public, uh, it's important that there be some kind of oversight mechanism to make sure that some sort of review mechanism to make sure that press releases are balanced. I think responsible companies are going to do that as well. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure how you institutionalize that uh, for companies. I do want to mention one other uh, point that it's tempting for us to think, you know, to, to phrase this in terms of how do we educate the public. But I do think there's a lot that we can be, in the field of gene transfer, there's a lot that we can learn from the public. This is a bi-directional flow of information that has to happen. And the example I would give is, you know, if you go back to mitochondrial replacement technique, you know, whether we proceed with using these techniques that could introduce alterations to the human germline is ultimately not entirely a scientific question about safety. It's also a question about whether or not we as a society want to support ventures into altering the human germline. And that's an example of something that we can't um, decide purely as scientists without knowing what public preferences are. The UK has been you know, outstanding in terms of public engagement to get a read on where the public is on these kinds of approaches. And I think we ought to be you know, thinking about that kind of model for many other areas of cutting edge uh, technologies. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you for the great talk. Um, I think uh, your last point about access is really probably something that uh, doesn't get uh, brought up or considered enough, or at least didn't, didn't seem to be that way at this conference. But, um, you know, we're already seeing problems with access to Luxterna being approved. There are two uh, Amish children, you know, that are, have no way of affording $1.7 million worth of therapy. Um, what, what, um, what can be done, do you think, to try to um, balance the need of companies to, you know, incentivize profit motive versus the needs of patients and the burden, you know, uh, basically how do we address access, you know, in a, in a, in a, system, in a systematic way? Right. So I'm not an economist, so I really don't have that much informative, you know, I, I don't really have, unfortunately I don't have a solution here. I, I have nothing, to, you know, there, there have been various kinds of mechanisms that people have used. So for example, uh, you know, there are some companies that have, uh, like Novartis, for example, uh, that's uh, used various techniques uh, uh, to make their products available. Uh, the, in Novartis, in particular, with the drug Imatinib, uh, had a program to make it available in low, low income countries. Many people just saw that as a smokescreen for strong intellectual property. There are various other kinds of intellectual property regimes uh, that one can use to try to kind of, uh, you know, to, 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 to make products available. Uh, but I'm not really expert on this. 
The only point that I would say, I, I'll just leave you with this, um, and this is not necessarily true of the biotech sector, but the pharmaceutical industry, you know, it is the most profitable industrial sector just about uh, in the world. And just to put that in perspective, uh, at least the numbers that I've seen, it's more profitable than banks. Like, think about that for a second. <laughs> they make more money, you know, they have a larger, you know, profit margin than banks. And so, you know, I, I do sometimes wonder, I, I think it's, you know, obviously there are ways that we need to harness the free market in order to incentivize innovation. But I wonder whether we've, you know, whether we're, we've sort of over-incentivized innovation in a way and under-incentivized uh, equity and, and access. And I think it's something we really ought to be thinking about. Thank you. I really liked your uh, comment about how in an informed consent document saying this therapy may or may not benefit you is equivalent to the probability between zero and one. And uh, as a statistician, I thought, yeah, we ought to be able to do better than that. And then I remembered that um, human, we mortal human beings are notoriously awful at evaluating probabilities. So uh, as, then you combine that with you know, people talking about right to try. If we say the probability this will benefit you is 10%, then by golly, I've got a right to try. You know? Maybe we do better leave well enough alone and just say may or may not benefit you. What do you think? Well, I, I think you're absolutely right that, uh, you know, um, uh, we human beings have, you know, challenges in terms of the way that we interpret numbers. That, that, you know, for example, you know, th there are certain techniques for communicating numbers that are more effective than others. Uh, natural frequencies, as, as you probably know, uh, generally people tend to sort of relate to natural frequencies much more than percentages, et, et cetera. Um, you know, I think that one has to be really, really, there's no sort of neutral phraseology to use for conveying probability, but I think we can think much more carefully about the ways that we phrase, you know, phrase this. So I think, you know, uh, I'm not sure leaving well enough, you know, I think, I think, sorry, I think the challenge is we, we, you have to convey low probability of success along with uncertainty at the same time, and it's very hard to, for, to convey this effectively to non-statisticians who are used to dealing with both of those entities at the same time. But I do think that uh, we probably, uh, you know, I think we can be conveying much more information by explaining to patients that they're probably not so much using numbers, but probably using verbal expressions of probability, like, you know, it's highly unlikely or it's very unlikely that you will experience a major clinical benefit by participating in this trial, something along those lines. Mm -hmm. One other point I want to make just for people to think about, no one ever talks about this. If you look at consent documents uh, in the benefit section, there's always a statement like, you know, you may or may not benefit. Then there's another line saying that, but participating in this trial will help to advance, you know, will help us. And that's another sort of completely vacuous, vacuous <laughs> statement. And we all, we all know that there are some trials that actually are impactful trials that are actually really likely to be informative, and others are, are garbage. I mean, there's a lot of bad trials out there. We ought to probably be leveling with patients also about the quality and the likely impactfulness of trials. Yeah. Three years from now, nobody will care. You know, right. That's, not, right. that's not a very right. incentivizing statement. Right. <laughs> well, anyway, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Then thank you very much, Jonathan. Okay. And we would like to close the session and thank all the speakers for their excellent, excellent presentations once more. Thank you.